Jackson Systems is your controls expert in the HVAC industry. With our top-notch technical support and customer service, we make life easier for you, the HVAC contractor. We offer free trainings on any product sold here at Jackson Systems, along with our filter fetch program, free thermostat and printing, home and business automation with connected sensors, cameras, and even smart stats from Nest, Ecobee, Honeywell, White Rogers, Google, and more. Visit us at jacksonsystems.com to see the products that continue to win industry acclaim among contractors worldwide. Jackson Systems, controls done right. You're listening to HVAC Shop Talk with Zach Sciotta and Ralph Wolf, a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Welcome back to HVAC Shop Talk. I am Zach Ciota, singing alongside Ralph Wolf, but only virtually. And today, we're going to start off this podcast by talking about something that me and Ralph love very much. But unfortunately, I think that sooner or later, and maybe sooner, that they're going to go away altogether in modern HVAC equipment. Do you know what I'm talking about, Ralph? The old 90-340 relay. That's a good relay right there. It's one of my favorites. I love it. I love that relay. You could do so many different things with it. Before Honeywell came out with thermostats that would bring the fan on when the humidifier came on, I would use that relay. When we put in humidifiers down here, you don't have to deal with a lot up there where you're at. But down here, we have to put in humidifiers all the time. And to me, guys have always wired them up wrong. They always turn them on when the heat came on. If your house is running low on humidity, you only run that humidifier when the call for heat is on. Then what's the point of even having a humidifier? Because the heat won't run long enough to satisfy your call for humidity. Why spend the money if you're not going to let that humidifier run? So I got the bright idea one time. I was, hey, why don't I just use a couple of relays? And I would always put the humidistat up in the living space for a lot of guys would just mount it to the return. So it would sense the return humidity and that was good enough for them. I always tried to go a step above and try to mount the humidistat up in the living area. The only drawback was, hey, how am I going to turn the fan on? So I started using that 90-340 relay and getting that done. Let me ask you a question related to that. With your new systems that are communicating from ICP, can you integrate a humidifier into the communicating setup? Yes, you can. It asks you on the setup if there's a humidifier installed. Oh, can you program it how to run? Can you run it with just a fan only too? When there's a call for humidity, it will bring on the humidifier and the fan at the same time. The heat doesn't have to run. Well, I'm going to learn a whole lot from you right now, Ralph, because I don't have any humidifiers because we have plenty of humidity supplied by the good Lord here. Is it different? Your relay setup that you use, and I'm not talking about communicating setup. I'm talking about before what you were talking about. Is it any different between a bypass humidifier or a, a steamer? I know EWC used to make steamers. They sold to fill controls. And that's actually where I got the idea, because with a steamer, you need a fan to come on and run. But with a bypass, that's the one I'm talking about, because I used a motorized bypass. It wasn't really a bypass because it didn't have a, a duct coming off the return, going to the humidifier, and then hitting the supply. It's the April Air Model 700, 710, I believe. I can't remember the exact model number, but, but it's the 700 series. It actually has a fan on it. That humidistat is just a dial type humidistat and it has no fan control whatsoever. So what I would do is I would use a EWC humidistat for the steamer and I would run it down the HH terminal, which turned the humidifier on. I would run it down and control the relay coil off of the HH terminal. And then I would wire it up from the fan wire on the control board of the furnace. Pretty slick, Ralph. You really know how to use your relays. Oh, I love them, man. I love them. But the only unfortunate thing is the new guys, as technology changes, it's just like the old rotary dial phones, the old black phone with the little dial on it. I love those, actually. I do, too. I remember I was a teenager talking on those things and even younger than that, talking on them. And the young guys won't know what we're talking about. Stick your finger and let's say the six hole and you'd spin it. I would always make it try to go fast backwards. So I'd use my finger to make it <laughs> backwards instead of just letting it go. And it, uh, uh, you know, it's a game. Yeah, it was just a game. 
I love that. My buddy had one of those phones. I would go over to his house just to call people because we had just a regular touchstone phone. But when I went to his house, he had a rotary phone. It was just shting, shting. I just love using that thing. I don't know why. Something to fiddle with, I guess. I don't know why neither. Uh, there's still some houses out there. They're very few and far between with those phones still hanging on the wall. They're not being used, of course, but they're still on the wall. I lived in a house in Burgaw that was a historical home. And on the wall was the mount for the wall hung rotary phone. It wasn't there anymore, but the wall mount was still there. I've been in a couple of those old houses. That's the nice part about doing service. You get to go in people's houses and see different things from the past you would never really see in ordinary life. That's the thing about technology and relays. The new guys aren't going to know. If they have an old system and they need to get the homeowner going in a pinch, they're not going to know how to go out to the truck and get a relay and bring it back out and bring it to the furnace or the air handler and, and wire that relay up. There's not a whole lot of those relays out there. For the guys who are listening, 9340 relay is a double pole, double throw relay, two poles, have a 24 volt coil powered for whatever. Cause I use them all the time. I was going to ask you this. I don't typically use anything anymore that has delays built into it. If I take out like a board that has a delay and I'm replacing it, with one of these relays, I'm not concerned with the delay any longer because it's a service capacity. What do you think about that? Well, the thermostat has delays on it. I wasn't thinking about that because I'm thinking about the old mercury stats that are on the wall still. Oh, yeah, there are yeah, some yeah. out there. I'm changing the system out tomorrow and the guy just bought the house and his mom was there. He wasn't there and she had two Honeywell thermostats, the new Lyric, the T6s. Her son works for RE Michael, actually, 60 miles away from where we're at and she got those thermostats through him. She asked me, can you put these on? I was like, sure, I'll put them on for you. And she's like, I just want to get rid of those old thermostats. Do you remember installing the new ones when they were mercury? I installed quite a few of them. Good grief. How old are you? Man, come on. I'm just kidding. I actually installed new ones too. Jim Bergman's older. By what, like an hour? <laughs> <laughs> I installed them too because when I came up in the mid 90s they still had mercury stats being installed there was digital stats that had come out already at that time but a lot of people had mercury stats I remember seeing digital train stats and digital carrier stats but I mean most of them were mercury when the new digitals came out I hated them you almost had to be a rocket scientist to figure them out oh my gosh I ran into a couple of those not necessarily the Honeywell but it had the little flip top door and there's 80 yep. buttons on there. And it's like, what, what is white, this all about? The old white Rogers sermon stats were like that. It's like seeing a computer from the 1960s. Why are there 400 buttons that are blinking different colors here? But all we do is have to turn on the air conditioner. Yeah. Or the you, heat. Had, you had occupy and non-occupy and you really <laughs> did have to have the book to program that thing. And That's even funny. today to come across it today, it's just like, Oh man, what do I do with this stupid thing? When I did work for a McDonald's, and I'd go down there and they had all their thermostats in the same spot because they had return air sensors where they got all their temperatures. I'd go down there in that room and they had these thermostats. It's like, there's 500 buttons on these thermostats. Why can't we just use a regular thermostat? Because they weren't doing anything special. They weren't being controlled by some headquarters a thousand miles away. They're just regular thermostats on the wall. They had to choose the ones with 500 buttons on. Yeah, isn't it funny how we were so analog back then? Technical things were really technical. You had to be, I'm not going to say smarter, but you had to have the manual to operate that thing. Where today, it's so simple. You put the thermostat on the wall, and as long as you know which two buttons to push at the same time, you can breeze right through it. The technology back then was complicated. It was. And that was back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Hold on. This, this is my segue. So let me see if I can get this right. That's around the same time. Our guest was perfecting his bubble solution. Oh, I love Big Blue. Yeah, it is the best by far. I, I'm so happy we, we have a guest on the show that we just love the products that he's created. And you can actually genuinely say to a guy, these are great products. During the interview, I actually said they were great products. Almost every guest that we've had on here, I or you have used the product and actually liked the product, love the product that we use. I mean, I don't want to name any names, but we had a guest one time. We were going to get him on because we didn't understand the product. But the more we researched it, the more we disliked it. And I think you probably could think about it and remember the guest I'm talking about. But since me and Ralph didn't believe in the product, and we didn't think that once the guest got here, 
we were going to be convinced. I mean, we knew it was a scam. So we just cut that interview off. I'm happy to say that if we bring people in here, it's stuff that we believe in. We just want to see what it's all about. We're not just trying to get these guests to come on to build numbers. We actually enjoy the product and we want to promote that product in some sort of way. So the product we're looking at today, if you haven't guessed it already, is Refrigeration Technologies. And the guy behind Refrigeration Technologies is John Pastorello. So without further ado, let's get into our interview with him. And he's going to tell us all about a myriad of products from Refrigeration Technologies. Roll it. Well, you're probably kicking yourself right now. October's here. You waited too long. And you didn't get 15% off on iManifold by using the special promotional code we gave you last month. Well, there's good news out there, guys. You can still get your 15% off. The only difference is now, you had to use a special code FALL SPECIAL when you check out at iManifold.com. You can get your iManifold probes, iConnect, all sorts of goodies of 15% off throughout the entire month. So don't hesitate. Head on over to iManifold.com and pick you up some new stuff today and enjoy getting potentially hundreds of dollars off. Don't forget to tell them HVAC Shop Talk sent you. Ralph, what makes EWC's Smart Bypass Damper so innovative? EWC Smart Bypass Damper automatically measures, maintains, and monitors operating static pressure of any zone system. Don't they all do that now? No, with EWC's curb blade design, it will maintain true static pressure in all modes of operation. It also comes with a five-year parts warranty and is the only bypass damper that is ACA compliant. Visit EWCcontrols.com for more information. So, John and Mike, what's the relation? Mike is my son. We're a family-run business. Uh, my wife takes care of all the phone traffic. Mike takes care of all the operations here. I am confined to the laboratory. Is that your request or where they stuck you? That's where I want to be. So I figured as much. Yeah, I, I don't want to look at the books. I don't want to look at any numbers. I just want to look at making new products and then improving the ones we have. You sound like me. I just want to go work on something, but I don't want to worry about the books. I don't want to worry about taking the calls. I just want to go do it. Exactly. How many guys work at Refrigeration Technologies? You know, myself, my wife, my son, we just hired a sales manager. We imported him all the way from Australia. His name is Cam. And we have warehouse workers, of course, sales reps throughout the world. Do y'all actually make the product on site? Oh, yes, definitely. We have fully automated fill equipment, mixing, all computer controlled, all batch analyze. We're very sophisticated here. Since you're working in the lab, do you take part in filling the bottle of Nylog? No, I developed a machine to fill it, which, <laughs> which was, you know, it's hard you, to get that stuff in a bottle. Yeah. Do you actually get to push the button to fill up the bottle? I, oh, I've done many of those. Yes. Yes. So if I open one up, it could be John's bottle that he filled up. <laughs> More than likely it's Matthew. So <laughs> he's our nylog filler. Right now, we can't fill enough bottles to keep up with demand. While we're on the subject of nylog, you had two different kinds. You had one for POE and one for mineral oil. Right. What is actually the difference between the two? The first one I developed was the nylog red, but we just called it nylog at the time. It was 1993, and POE wasn't on the radar. It was made from mineral oil because... Everything out there was R12, R22 at the time. Then as POEs came into fruition, I developed a POE version of it. And since the label on the first one was red, we put the other label blue and we just called them not like red and not like blue. Now, the difference is why we have two different versions is mainly because at that point in time, contractors were leery about mixing oils right and they felt that oh you can't use poe on a mineral oil system or you can't use mineral oil on a poe system rather than fight stupid we kept two different versions because actually the poe version can be used just about on anything before you came on we were talking about this exact same subject i asked zach i said zach i wonder really what the difference is because is it because everybody was scared of mixing oils just what you just said 
I said, yes, I, yeah. I wonder if you can use one on both of them. Yeah, I, I use the blue for everything. Well, After that. people hear this, you're not going to sell any more red. <laughs> well, that's okay because it's there's no R12 systems out there anymore. And we were selling a lot of nylogs in the automotive industry. They used the nylog on O-ring gaskets. If you use the POE on those old O-rings for R12, it caused them to shrink up. Preferably, you'd have to use the red. Is that what you developed nylog for, was to keep the O-rings from shrinking? No, no. I just developed it as a better alternative to the adhesives out there. Each trade, it seemed, had a specialized sealant. You mean like leak lock in the HVAC industry? You take like the air brake industry. There's a certain sealant that you use just for air brakes. And you can't use anything else but that sealant because it can mess up an air brake system on a truck. And then there's a certain sealants for hydraulic systems, such as on airplanes. And you can't use any other sealant for those delicate hydraulic systems. There was really nothing that was specific for our industry at the time. Most of the sealants were basically barred from the plumbing industry, just regular old pipe dopes. One of the first things I was told when I was learning refrigeration is you never put anything on a gasket or thread other than oil. And it was deeply ingrained in me. I decided to make a gasket and thread sealant from oil. Therefore, I don't break any of the rules. <laughs> now, any of the rules I was taught, the advantage of it over like a, a leak lock or other sealant is you can use it on gaskets. You can use it on O-rings. You could even put it on a Schrader valve before you tighten it down. I thought it was really, really neat stuff. We came out with it in 1993, but it really didn't take off till about 2008, 2009, 2010. I remember when it took off. A lot of that was due to YouTube videos that were coming out. Yep. yep. Uh, a lot of good technicians out there were demonstrating it. Did you all of a sudden see a boost in sales and wonder, where's these sales coming from? Got pretty obvious because of the emails and the phone calls we were getting. Then we had the 410A mini splits come out. And people were learning that really the only thing that was stopping the flare leaks on the 410A mini split systems was the nylock. That really helped us a lot. As long as they keep making those mini splits with flare fittings, we'll still be in business. I don't really want to make this a podcast all about strictly nylog. Sure. Really kind of want to go back to the beginning. And how'd you start off? Because there is one product that you have that I have actually walked into the supply house and they not sell it. I've left and went somewhere else to buy it. That's got to be Big Blue. How'd you know? <laughs> That's <pretty> good. <laughs> How did you know? Because supply houses say, you know, if we don't have big blue on the shelf, they'll just leave and go to another place. They'll go to Johnstone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have another story about it too. Company I used to work for, their warehouse guy would buy all the consumables, screws, tape, big blue, or whatever that he thought was the best. And he bought another brand. I forget which one it was. I didn't use it. I went to the supply house and bought Big Blue and I got in trouble for it. Really? Well, because they supplied it and I was supposed to get it through the warehouse and I went to the supply house and bought it. They got mad because they had bought some. I wasn't using it. Hey, Ralph, let me ask you a question <laughs> before we ask John another question. Why is it that you won't use anything else but Big Blue? I've used other brands. It seems like the consistency of the other brands just isn't the same. So, John, what sets it apart from other brands of leak detectors? There's certain numbers we have to hit with a leak detector solution. Just like when you walk up to a system, you know what the target superheater subcooling has got to be. It's got to hit these certain numbers. We know that there's a certain viscosity number we have to hit, and there's a certain surface temperature number we have to hit. And this has all been done with experiments I've done since back in the 80s. A lot of the ingredients that we put in there help us hit those numbers. We know that too much viscosity is just as bad as too little viscosity. Surface tension has to hit a certain range. Otherwise, we don't get bubble volume and the bubble clusters that hold, especially on micro leaks, real, real small leaks. 
we need very, very low surface tension fluid. So there doesn't need to be a lot of energy behind that leak in order to form a bubble. Less energy, proper viscosity, those are some key numbers we need to hit when we're QCing our batches or if we're looking at competitor products out there, we'll see how far their numbers are off and everything and just kind of say, okay, well, these guys haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> well, I've always used it as well. I always carry big blue, but I noticed on your website, you have a big blue for low temperature as well. What's the difference with that? When I first came out with big blue being in California, we didn't know that people back east wanted leak detectors that wouldn't freeze on the truck overnight. I had to come out with a leak detector with like 50% propylene glycol in it so it wouldn't freeze overnight in the truck. Doesn't make quite as good as leak detector as the regular Big Blue, but you know we're pretty close. I've worked on that for many, many years to try and get it close as possible. We have to satisfy that part of the market or they're used to having bubble solution not freeze overnight in the truck. Well, if it thaws out, does it hurt the makeup? Not at all. People just don't want to take the time of sticking it under the heater and thawing it out. When you went to college, you went to college for chemistry? Yes. Yeah, I was a chemistry slash biology major. That was going to be my career. I thought it was kind of sexy if you wore a lab coat and worked in a lab and so John was sexy and he knew it. So yeah. So he decided to leave the chemistry industry and become an HVAC contractor. No, I actually found myself out of a job. The particular lab I was working at at that time went out of business. I just needed a job real quick. And gosh, this one company advertised like almost a full page ad hiring AC installers, no experience necessary. So I figured, you know, I'll just go down and apply for this job, work at it until I can find another lab position. And, but actually, when I got out on an installation crew, and I just loved the work. Working in a lab was like working on an assembly line. You did the same thing over and over every day. I worked in a medical lab. I'd show up every day, being the lowest man on the totem pole. There were 200 urines for me to analyze. I did this every day. <laughs> Even the older guys, they'd come into work and the head chemist, he'd have 300 blood sugars to do and maybe 50 cholesterols to do. They did the same thing over and over every day. And you don't really need a college degree to do any of this stuff because everything was test kits or test strips. It was very boring work out there in the field, cutting air conditioning and a Working with the crews out there, I just kind of loved it. And the pay was better. Much Wait better. a second. Wait a second. You went and got a four-year degree? Actually, I never got my degree. Oh, you never got <laughs> your degree? No, I'm like two classes short of a degree. Because I started a contracting business, and I said, I don't need this degree. I'm making four to five times the money being a contractor than I ever would be as a chemist, even a head chemist, even a lab supervisor. I enjoyed the challenge. You guys know, you walk up to oh, yeah. a job, and you don't know what you're going to find. More challenging experience for sure. If you wouldn't have had to go into that one lab and test urine all day long, we would never have Big Blue or <laughs> Nylog. That's correct. That's a crazy story right there. It is. It is. I like it, though. <laughs> I like the side note is that no one needs college. Yeah, there's an old <laughs> saying. There's these two ladies, and they're at a high school reunion, and one lady says, my son just graduated from Harvard with a PhD. The other lady says, well, my son just graduated from trade tech with a J-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Mike Rowe would like that. That's the way I feel about it, too. I actually only went through one year of college myself. And you said you were two classes short. I think I was 35 classes short. Yeah. Still, I didn't quite make it there. I was on the dean's list for that one semester, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I was fortunate enough. I joined the military and got the experience through there. Oh, that's great training, too. 
some might say it's better training than college on a lot of accounts. Yeah. More disciplined, that's for sure. What did make you come up with Big Blue? I started doing my AC and service work back in the 70s. Back then, especially when I started out on my own, I had like the first generation electronic leak detector, which was a Robin Air. They were kind of really slow and you didn't know when you got a hit or if it was a miss. They were very temperamental. You really relied on soap bubbles really to do all your leak detection. Leak detectors out there, I discovered after a while that they were just really poorly formulated. They didn't work all the time. They didn't really make much in the way of bubbles. Walk up to a maybe a fitting that's got some oil on it and know it's leaking there. And I put the electronic up to it. And these old Robin Airs, you'd have to hold them up to the joint and leave them there for quite a long time before you get a hit. It wasn't maybe till five years later the H10 came out and and the H10 had an actual pump on it. So that's what made the difference between the first generation to the second generation of electronics. We relied on bubbles. So one time I said, you know what, I'm just gonna go out and learn how to make my own bubble solution. Cause I, I tried all the brands. I went to the toy store, tried that stuff. I just gotta make my own bubble solution. And I started hitting the libraries on weekends and hit the patent office see what kind of information I could find on leak detector solutions and finally put together several hundred formulations of leak detectors, bubble making formulas and the such. Just about every night after I got off work, I set up a little lab in my kitchen and I'd work on making bubbles until I came up with some formulations that I felt were better than what was out there. I'd make some formulations at night. Then the next day when I'd go out on my service calls, I'd check them out on actual leaks. That was about two years of just fiddling around. When I got some stuff I thought was a really great formulation, I started handing it out to my uh, service buddies. They kind of laughed at me at first, but they'd come back and tell me, they said, hey, John, I just found leaks on this one unit that I never could find before. You got to start selling this stuff. Eventually, they talked me into start selling it. That's how it all came to be. It's just a little hobby. Develop a bubble leak detector that I could use just for my own personal use. I'm sure there's tools or rigs that you guys have made to pull your vacuums, to reach deep into coils or whatever that you've come up with that no one else has to help you do your job better. And that's what it was all about. Has the formulation changed any over the years? We've constantly upgraded the formulation, constantly. In fact, I have a new formulation, not really new, but an upgrade coming out right after the first of the year. It's one of the things I love to do in the lab is play with bubbles. And play with bubbles? You sound like play, a kid, I John. With bubbles. <laughs> I make all kinds of bubbles. I make the giant bubbles. I make bubbles <laughs> that when they pop, they crackle. Wow, I can see John in the lab with his white lab coat singing, I'm too sexy for my lab coat while he's playing with his bubbles. <laughs> it's not a giant bubble. I tell you, it's a big hit with kids at parties. So I bet. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I've been fortunate enough to gain a reputation actually in the bubble world. And I've actually helped reformulate some toy bubble solutions for a couple toy companies. So that's been fun. Wow. The closest thing I ever came to developing my own bubbles when I didn't have any of yours is spit on my finger and put it around <laughs> the valve core to see if a bubble would come up. And it works. Well, if you check the viscosity of Big Blue, it's kind of sticky and tacky, just like spit. Wow. See, I'm onto something. You're onto something. Now, if You're I could just something. fill a bottle of it. <laughs> Think of stuff like that. Ralph, how many times have you used soap bubbles like dish soap? Or I've actually used kids' bubbles before when I didn't have anything else. Yeah, I've, yeah. Used, I've used Dawn. She used those on gas lines before, using yep. Dawn. I remember that. We're yep. primitive creatures. How do you think Big Blue fits in with modern leak detection? Because you mentioned the H10, which is still around. More advanced electronic leak detection. How does it fit in with those? Where do you apply Big Blue in the modern world? In the modern world, you use it really as a visual indicator. Let's say you get a hit somewhere on a coil with your electronic and then you want to go down and you want to pinpoint it with bubbles. Now, let me tell you the little trick here about applying bubble solution. We like tricks, John. Yes. Okay. 
here's what you need to do. I've seen a lot of the videos out there and everyone does it wrong. When you apply bubble leak detector, you want to apply it as a flat liquid with no bubbles or foam. Okay. Right. So start out with a flat liquid, no bubbles, no foam. If you start to see little bubbles or foam forming, you know that's a leak and it wasn't bubbles or foam formed due to the spray. Whenever I spray the bubbles on, I always try to get the tip as close to the joint as I can and not like do a full squeeze, but just do a little partial squeeze. So it just goes on, like you said, just as a liquid with no yes. bubbles at all. Yes, definitely. That's one of the tricks of finding the micro leaks, the really small leaks, is you've got to make sure it's a flat liquid, no bubbles, no foam, and come back and recheck every five, 10 minutes to see if there's any clusters forming. When would you use the little dauber instead of a spray? Before Big Blue came out, everything was in a dauber. And then I came out with the spray type. I want to tell you how many wholesalers told me that I didn't know how to package a product because no one's going to buy a leak detector in a spray bottle. They want to see well, it in a dauber. <laughs> the, problem, the problem with the dauber is as you're dabbing it on, you're creating bubbles. Exactly. That was the problem because when I was developing Big Blue, I would actually get a microscope out and I would zoom in on a leak and I would lay fluid on that leak to see how the gas would interact with the fluid. I learned a lot about leaks and I learned a lot about bubble formulations just by looking at bubbles formed under a microscope and seeing how the gas actually comes out of a leak and how it interfaces with the liquid. So yes, definitely. We sell a product in a dauber because people have come back to us and say, you know, I like your big blue, but if you put it in a dauber, I'd probably use it because it fits in my tool pouch. Every time you package one of those up, do you think, man, I hate that I had to sell this because it's going to create bubbles? You know? Yeah, we've created kind of a different viscosity for that particular solution to kind of minimize that. Not totally eliminate it, but it minimizes that. The viscosity of our spray solution is much different than the viscosity of our Dauber version. Meet Zoomlock, the 10-second flame-free refrigerant fitting from Parker. Reduce labor costs by 60% with no brazing, no flame, and no fire spotter. Discover how Zoomlock can help you be more efficient and productive. Visit zoomlock.com for more information. Thank you for listening to HVAC Shop Talk. Make sure you tune in later this week to hear part two of the interview with John from Refrigeration Technologies. Also, we'll be releasing a new short podcast telling you what you have to do to win the next giveaway. And don't forget, no matter what giveaway we're doing, we'll be doing a side giveaway for the people on the email list. So if you're not on the email list, you can always go to Facebook, to our Facebook page, and sign up there. There'll be an email sign-up button. You can also... Look at the description of these podcasts, and there'll be a link there. If you can't find it there, and you don't want to go to Facebook, you can always go to YouTube. and It'll be in the description of a lot of our videos. I will try to add it to our new videos, so it'll be easy to find. But as always, guys, we appreciate you listening, and we'll see you on the next one.